want to get all the way through independent groups and related groups today if you can. All right. So for last time, we introduced uh, <coughs> data for the independent groups t-test. For today, you're going to need to have those handouts out that I gave you last time. So make sure you've got them all with you. You've got your formula sheets. You've got your table of critical values. Um, uh, your little chart that lays out all the different formulas for the different Z scores and t-tests. Um, those are just handy to have out. I'll be pulling them out and putting them on the display. Um, but it's good to have them there in front of you because it's sometimes easier to read them. All right, so I asked you um, to revisit your 35-10 days as preparation for today, right? To go and calculate uh, descriptive statistics that you had learned in 35-10, including mean, sum of squares, and sample variance for these two groups. So let's start with the modified story group. Um, what was the mean for the modified story group that you got? 10.33. She says with confidence. 10.33? Does anyone want to give her some feedback about whether or not she got it right? That's what, that's what I got. So if you got it wrong, you're all wrong together. All right. Math by consensus is my favorite. You're right, actually. So 10.33. All right, 10.33. And did anybody get the sum of squares for that? 93.34. I love the intention. 93.34? What do you think? Yeah, people are nodding. 93.34. Yes. OK. 93.34. Right? And sample variance is sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, right? 18.67. Okay, good. Isn't it nice to know you still remember that stuff? You're like, oh, man, 35, 10. It was like a million years ago. Maybe it was just last semester. But in my other class, I had people who took it two years ago. So they're trying to remember from two years ago. Can you remember? Can you? Well, I don't know that necessarily you always have control over when you took it two years ago. Sometimes you couldn't get in, or other stuff happens in your life, you know, whatever. But it's coming back, so that's good. Okay, so what about the mean for the ordinary group? Okay, let's do a jab word intonation this time. Say it again? Six. Six. Yes, with confidence. All right, and our sum of squares. Oh, round numbers, aren't they nice? And our sample variance? 5.6. Hmm? 5.6. 5.6? All right. Okay, so if you don't know where these numbers came from, or you don't remember how to get these numbers, this is a, a good thing to review. Come see me, talk to Javier, if you don't remember how to do some squares or sample variance. Um, we're going to keep coming back to these. There, these are things from 3510 that I'm just going to assume that you know how to do. All right. So we've calculated those basic statistics. Now, if you take a look at your worksheet, down here at the bottom, it says, once you have calculated the sample variance for group one and the sample variance for group two and something called Degrees of freedom common, I haven't even told you what that is yet. It's possible to perform an F-max test to verify that the samples being compared display homogeneity of variance. Oh my gosh, what the heck does that mean? Okay. But the next sentence gives us hope. If they do not, in other words, if you reject the null hypothesis on the F-max test, then there's no reason to proceed with the rest of your t-test calculations. So if you're hoping you don't have to do the whole rest of the problem, this is where you might actually get a reason why you don't have to. Let me explain to you what's going on here. Do you remember when we talked about between subjects designs and we said that the biggest challenge with creating a, an effective between subjects design is creating groups of subjects that are similar enough to compare, right? We said that over and over and over. Well, it turns out there, there are actually statistics that let researchers determine whether or not they've successfully done that. And one of those 
statistics that we can use is something called Fmax. Fmax lets us calculate something called homogeneity of variance. Homogeneity means similarity, right? When something is homogeneous, it's the same, right? Homo is the same. Okay? So homo homogeneous, homogeneity means the same. And so when you have homogeneity of variance, that means that the samples you're comparing have similar variances. And that means that they're, they don't differ too much from each other. So Fmax is a way that we can statistically establish, before we do a bunch of other math, that the groups we have are similar enough to compare. And it's actually a pretty easy test to do. In order to calculate it, all you need are the sample variances for your different independent samples. And then you have to figure out something called degrees of freedom common, which is actually really easy once you know what it is. And you have to figure out something called K, which is the number of samples that you're comparing. Now, we know what our two sample variances are. And to calculate F max observed, we just take the largest sample variance and we divide by the smallest sample variance for our data. Now, in this case, we're doing a t-test, which means we only have two samples to work with. So we're just going to take the bigger one and put it over the smaller one. So in this case, we're going to take 18.67. And we're going to put it over 5.6. And we're going to do a calculation, and that's going to give us an observed value for x max. Can somebody tell me what that value is? Three point three three. Three point three three. That rounded to two decimal places. Three point three three. So we want to look up now a critical value. The critical values for Fmax are located in the critical values for the Fmax statistic table. That's on the back of the t-test critical table. So it should be basically page two of your critical value packet. Do you see it? Can you find it? Anybody who doesn't have their critical value table? Okay. We want to have a set piece. And there's some other handouts from last time I want to make sure you get. You need a set two? For you. I have another set in here. Yep. Okay, so if we look at this table, we see that it says Critical values for alpha equal 0.05 are in light phase type, and for alpha 0.01 in bold phase type. So we're talking about alpha 0.05. So we're going to be looking for a number in light phase type. Now we need to find some n minus 1 and some k equals number of samples. Well, how many samples do we have? Two. two. Okay, so k equals 2. So we know we're looking here in this first column. Okay. Then it says n minus 1. The question is, well, which n? Because we have two n's, and the answer here is it's the n they have in common, okay, n common. n common <coughs> is the common sample size for all the samples in your study. So Fmax only works if all the samples are of the same size. If the samples are of different sizes, you can't use Fmax. You have to use a different test. We're not going to talk about those tests because they're more complicated to do. But if your samples are all of the same size, then you can do an Fmax test. So n common in this case is going to be 6. And degrees of freedom common, which is the common degrees of freedom for all of our samples, is going to be 5. So that's our n minus 1. That's what we're going to use over there on the left-hand side. So that means we're going to go here, 
first column, second row. We're going to look for the number in light face type, and that is 7.15. So our critical value, let me write this over here. our critical value is 7.15. Our observed value is 3.33. And that's the relationship between them. The critical value is more extreme than the observed value. So if this is the case, if we're looking at a critical value and observed value, are we going to reject the null hypothesis or retain the null hypothesis in this case? Imagine that we have a distribution like this. Here's a cutoff value of 7.15. Okay, that's our critical value. Our observed value is there. Are we going to reject or retain? Retain. Okay, we're going to retain the null hypothesis. So what does that mean when we retain the null hypothesis? It means there's no effect. It means there's no difference between these groups, right? That's good in this case. When we calculate F max, we want no significant difference between these groups because that means they're similar enough to compare. So we want to retain the null hypothesis when we do this test. The good news is, is that if you run this test and you do reject the null, you can stop. Because it means the groups are already too different. And comparing them could give you a false positive. So, of course, because this is a practice problem, they're similar enough to compare we can proceed. But uh, I just wanted you to know about this. Now, we don't do F max for related groups t-test or a t-test for within subjects design. Why not? Because they're already similar because it's the same group, right? We're just testing the same group of people multiple times. So we only do this for between subjects t-test. Okay, it's the only time we do it. We don't have to do it for within subjects. And that's the question on the problem set that's due a week from today. So just so you know. All right. So let's come back to our problem now that we know we can proceed with confidence. Can you get the focus on there? Okay. Okay. Now, it says we need to calculate pooled degrees of freedom, pooled sum of squares, and pooled sample variance. Okay. Pooled degrees of freedom, pooled sum of squares, and pooled sample variance. When we say pooled, we mean for our two samples combined together. So I'm going to turn off this so that I have some room to work. So everybody should have this problem out in front of them. Is there anybody who doesn't have the handout with this problem? Maybe we have three, three people, four people. Let me show you the right one. Give it up. Here we go. That's not the right one. This is not the one. This one. This one. This one. And there. Okay, that's also available online. But. All right. I'm going to turn this off so that I actually have some room to work. All right. This board is small. Okay. So we need to do. Sum, it says degrees of freedom pool, sum of squares pool, sample variance pool. All right, now, if you have your form, the one that looks like this from last time, you want to get that out? Degrees of freedom pool, that's what we use to look up the critical value. And the formula for that is the degrees of freedom for group one plus the degrees of freedom for group two. So we know that the degrees of freedom for group one is five. The degrees of freedom for group two is five. So five plus five 
principles, 10. So our degrees of freedom pooled is 10. Degrees of freedom pooled is the degrees of freedom we use to look up the critical value for an independent samples t-test. Sum of squares pooled is calculated in a similar way. It's the sum of squares for group 1 plus the sum of squares for group 2. So we figured those things out right here. 93.34 and 28. And if I add those together, what do I get? One twenty one point three four. Do I have confirmation from somebody else? Yes. That's right. Okay. So that's our sum of squares pool. Now, to calculate the pooled sample variance, we're now going to take sum of squares pool over degrees of freedom pool. Sample variance is always some sum of square something over some degrees of freedom something. In this case, because we're talking about pool values, yeah. I got 121.44. 121? Typo, okay. Oh, your typo. Yeah. Okay. So we know what we know where it came from. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. That'll do it to you. Okay, so it's 121.34, so now we're going to take 121.34, and we're going to divide it by the degrees of freedom pool, and what do we get? Hmm? 12.13. Are we all okay with that number? Know where it came from? All right, so that's got us through B. Next it says, calculate the standard error for the two, sample, two samples combined. Okay. So standard error is calculated like this. So we know what our pooled sample variance is. We just calculated it. We know what our sample size for group one is. We know what our sample size is for group two. So can someone tell me what 12.13 divided by six is? Do I have confirmation from anyone? 2.02? Okay, fortunately those calculations are the same, so we can just write them twice. All right, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, and even without a calculator, say that those two added together is 4.04. .04. And if I take the square root of 4.04, .04, what do I get? Yes, I'm waiting for confirmation. You don't count. Well, you do count. I love you, dear. <laughs> You're not taking the test, AI. 2.01. Do I have anybody else who did it and can say yes, that's correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Okay, so that is now our estimated standard error. And now we have the last calculation before we calculate T observed. We have to figure out the mean difference. Okay. And mean difference is going to be mean for group one minus the mean for group two. So mean for group one minus the mean for group two is going to be 10.33 minus 6 
which is? 4.33. Okay. So is everybody okay with where all of those numbers came from up to this point? I'm going to erase a few guys I, so I can reclaim some board space. All right, so now we've calculated the difference in our two means. We've calculated the estimated standard error for the pooled scores. So now we're going to calculate T observed. And that's going to be our mean difference over <coughs> our estimated standard error. And we determined that this is 4.33 over, what was our estimated standard error again? 2.01. 2.01. Okay. And so if I calculate that value, what do I get? 4.33 divided by 2.01. Okay, I have a vote for 2.15. That works for you too? Works for you? All right. And we're going to mark it as positive 2.15 because that matters. Because this is a t-test, so it could be positive or negative. So we're going to mark it as positive to show that we know that's positive. And now we do our comparison. Now we evaluate our null hypothesis. So we're going to have to compare our critical value to our observed value. Our observed value is positive 2.15. Did we determine what our critical value was before? Last positive time? 1.81. Hmm? Positive 1.81. And the relationship between these is that the observed value is more extreme. Okay. Give you a visual on that. A rough visual. Okay. Here is our critical value. Our observed value is out here at 2.15. So do I have a statistically significant effect? Yes, I do. My critical value is not as far out as my observed value. My observed value is out there in the tail. It's an outlier. It's extreme. So I can, do I retain or reject the null hypothesis? Reject. Yes. So our two groups are significantly different from one another in terms of our dependent variable. Okay. So now we've gone through, we've evaluated the null hypothesis. Now we're going to calculate measures of effect size. Okay, we've got a statistically significant result. Our samples are pretty small. There are only six. So if you had to guess, given that our samples are very small, and we got a clear statistically significant result, do you think we're going to have a small effect or a large effect? <coughs> do you think the effect of the IV was small or large? Just if you had to guess. It got significant with really small samples. Think about this. Okay. I want you to imagine that you live in Tokyo. Now, you're hanging out in Tokyo, you know, some nice little hotel out there on the beach, and a cat runs by. What do you think the chances are that you're actually going to notice the cat if you're hanging out on the beach in Tokyo? You're on vacation probably having some fabulous sake, some delicious food with somebody fabulous, enjoying the sunset. Do you think you're going to notice that cat? Probably not. Cat's not very big. Cat's not going to draw your attention. What if a cow showed up on the beach? Do you think you'd notice the cow? Yeah, probably. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit more unusual. It depends on how much sake you've had. <laughs> What if Godzilla rises up out of the ocean? 
Is there any way you're going to miss that, regardless of how much sake you've had? No. I want you to think about those three things, the cat, the cow, and Godzilla, as a small, medium, and large treatment effect. Okay? When an effect is small, when it's cat size, you're much more likely to miss it than if it's cow size or Godzilla size. If it's Godzilla size, it doesn't matter how drunk you are. In other words, you could design a study that's, that's just drunk, right? I mean, it's bad. But if the effect size is Godzilla size, you'll probably find it. But as the effects get smaller, your studies have to be better and better designed in order to observe the treatment effect. You're going to miss little tiny cats because they're just not big enough to grab your attention. Cow, maybe, depending on how much stock you've had. But Godzilla, you'll see them every time. Now, I want you to imagine this. What if you're sitting there on the beach and a thousand cats come walking down the beach? Are you going to see them? Is there any way you're going to miss a thousand cats walking down the beach? No. Okay. They've turned the beach into their litter box. There's no way, right? I mean, it's a thousand cats. You're never going to miss them. I want you to think about that as sample size. Okay. When you have a herd of cats, you've got many, many, many opportunities to see those cats. So you, when you have a really small treatment effect, a cat size treatment effect, then in order to see it consistently, you need to have lots of chances to see it. In other words, you need to have a big sample size. So for a small treatment effect to give you statistically significant results, you're going to need a really big sample. But when you have a really big treatment effect, like Godzilla size, you can have a really small sample and you still won't miss it because the effect size is so big. And then with cows, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you know, you could have two or three or four cows walk down the beach and you'd be pretty sure not to miss that. So the bigger the effect size, the smaller the sample can be and you still get statistically significant results. Does that make sense? I'm trying to give you a visual representation of this with Godzilla and cats and cows on the beach. Plus, I just want to go back to Tokyo. So, because <laughs> Japan is great. Um, so, when we think about the relationship between sample size, effect size, and significance, you, know, you want to remember that. You can get statistical significance with a small sample. But if you do, probably your effect size is big. So one or two Godzillas you're not going to miss. If you get a statistically significant result with a large sample, then you can, it may be that you have all the way down to a small effect size. I mean, you could have a thousand cats or a thousand cows or a thousand Godzillas. You're going to see it, right? You've got a big sample. You're going to see it. So think about this now. Now I'll come back. Now that I've given you some bizarre mental images. We have six kids in each sample here. So a normal, a good size sample is 30 subjects. We've got 12, six in each sample. So this is a very small sample. We got clear significance. We're out here. We're not, we're not hanging around that critical value. It's not questionable. It's out here, quite clearly in the critical zone. So do you think that our treatment effect is small, medium, or large? large. Yes. Now, does it make sense why? Okay. Well, think of it. We have a pretty small sample, which means when we have a small sample, that means that we have very few chances to observe statistical significance. The chance that we're going to actually get a big effect like this suggests that, in fact, it's a not even though we have a small sample, we're probably talking cows or Godzillas, not cats. Because if it were cats, we probably wouldn't have gotten significance because our samples are so small. Does that help? My weird vision is like, I'm learning some effect size. I mean, just if you can try to visualize it, right? Um, maybe it would be easier if I said small effect was like mice, you know, and then you move up to cows, and then you move up to Godzilla. Nobody ever misses Godzilla. That's the giant treatment effect nobody ever misses. All right. So we have, we're going to calculate effect size, and we're guessing that it's going to be medium or large, probably large, given that 
our sample is really small, and yet we got really clear significance. So we're going to do this two ways. First way we can do this is with Cohen's D. Now Cohen's D for independent groups T test. uses a mean difference over a standard deviation. Cohen's D always does that. The question is, what mean difference and what standard deviation are appropriate for this particular test? And the mean difference that we use for Cohen's D is always the same as the mean difference we use for T observed. It's always true. So our T observed used for its numerator 10.33 minus 6, right? That's exactly what we're going to use for Cohen's D. It's the same. Now we need a standard deviation. The question is, well, what standard deviation do we use? Well, you'll recall that standard deviation is the square root of variance. And we only have one variance that we're using with our t-observed, and that is this one, our pooled sample variance. What was our pooled sample variance again? 12.13 or something like that? I can't believe I have brain cells dedicated to that number. So if I want to calculate this value, I'm going to take the square root of that. So the square root of 12.13 is what? 3.48. 3.48. Do we have confirmation on that? The square root of 12.13 is 3.48? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Okay. So here we go. 4.33 divided by 3.48. What does that give me? One point two four. Okay, now how do I know whether this is a small, medium, or large effect? <coughs> How do I know? Well, it turns out that in that handy t-test for independent samples overview I gave you before that you can hardly see now because I'm moving it plus there's stuff written on the board. Let me pull this down so you can look at it. It's like a racing. Okay. On page two of that handout from last time, I gave you the formula for cons D and the ranges for small, medium, and large effects. I also gave you R squared and the ranges for small, medium, and large effects. So given these ranges, do we have small, medium, or large effect with 1.24? Large. Large, definitely large. We've got a very large effect. I'm trying to find more of these for people who weren't here because I realize they're looking at me like, what are you talking about? similar reports of effect size. So with a Cohen's D this large, I would also expect that R squared would also be quite large. So let's go ahead and do that calculation just to see. Okay, for R squared, the default, default formula is T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. And the question is, 
which t and which degrees of freedom? I will tell you that in R squared, the t is always t observed, whatever the one was that you just calculated. And the degrees of freedom is whatever degrees of freedom you used to look up the critical value. So for an independent samples t-test, that's going to be degrees of freedom pooled. It would be different for a single sample t-test. It will be different for a related samples t-test. But for the independent samples t-test, the proper degrees of freedom to put in that slot is degrees of freedom pool. So we know that our t observed is 2.15. So square that, 2.15 squared plus, our degrees of freedom pooled is 10. What is 2.15 squared? 1.62? 4.62. Confirmation? Yes? So what is 4.62 divided by 14.62? Confirmation? Yes? So we have an R squared of 0.32 or 32%. Is that a small, medium, or large effect? Small, medium, or large? Large. Very large. Okay. So both of our measures of effect size gave us the same information. We have a very large treatment effect. Now what does that mean in terms of our study? So in our study, we were looking at whether children who read a story for, for, with their name in it, children who read a story with their name in it, would read for a significantly longer period of time than children reading a story that didn't have their name in it. Right? That was what we were looking at. That's the hypothesis we were exploring. And it turns out that we got a statistically significant result. Turns out that children who read a story with their name in it read for a significantly longer period of time than children who read a story that doesn't have their name in it. And the fact that we got large treatment effects means that this name thing really, really matters to little kids. They love it. It doesn't just improve their attention a little bit. It improves their attention a lot. Kids love themselves. Okay? They love reading about themselves. They love talking about themselves. They love doing things for themselves, even if it's not helping. Okay? So when you put a kid's name in a book, you name one of the characters after the kid who's reading the book, that kid is going to read a lot longer because it matters more. That's what that effect size means. It's a big deal to that kid. That really makes a difference in how long a child will read. So we figured it out both with Cohen's D and with R squared. We can summarize it like I just did. Right? All we're doing is taking that null hypothesis we generated last time, or that alternate hypothesis we generated last time, and picking the correct one, modifying the verb, so we got a significant result, so taking the alternate hypothesis is appropriate, because we did get a significant difference. So children who read a story with their name in it read for a significantly longer period of time than children who read a story without their name in it. That's our result. It's got all of our pieces in it, what groups were compared, what was compared about the groups, whether or not the difference was significant, and if it was, the direction of the effect. Those are the four things you have to include. Plus our bonus thing that you want to include, make it clear whether your comparison was between or within subjects. The secret fifth point of the four point strategy. Now, once we've done that, we 
can summarize our results in an APA-style statistical statement. And I will expect you to be able to do both. Summarize it in words, like we just did, or summarize it in APA style. To summarize a t-test, a completed t-test in APA style, here's what you do. You start with the name of the test, t. Okay, so we're doing a t-test, so we're going to start by writing lowercase t. That's the symbol for this test. Then in parentheses, we're going to put the degrees of freedom that we use to look up the critical value. In this case, degrees of freedom pooled, because that's what we use to look up the critical value for an independent samples t-test. So that would be 10. And equals. And now we're going to put our observed value. And we're going to mark it for polarity, positive or negative. Our observed value was 2.15, is that right? 2.15. So we're going to put our observed value next. Then a comma. Now we're going to indicate the probability of getting this value as an observed value given this degrees of freedom. What we know is that the probability of getting that is less than 0.05. And we know that because we got a statistically significant result. And the probability of 0.05 is the critical value. That's the one we looked up in the table. And we know that this value was further out in the tail than our critical value. So the probability of getting this is less than 0.05. And that's why we write that here. So this is telling us right here that our result was statistically significant. If you do this on computer, like you use SPSS or SAS or something like that, it'll actually tell you the actual factual value. It'll tell you what the probability of getting this observed value is. So in an article, like the one you're reading for next time, you might actually see them write something like, you know, P equals 0.017, because they actually know exactly what the probability is of getting this. They know exactly where it is in the distribution and can tell you. But in this class, we're not doing that. All you need to know is whether or not it was more extreme than the critical value. And it was, so we'll just say it's less than 0.05. Yeah? And that's your alpha, right? Yeah, that's your alpha. Yeah. You got it. That's alpha. So if I give you an alpha of 0.01, and it's statistically significant, then you would write 0.01. In this case, it was 0.05. Next thing you want to do is indicate whether the test was one-tailed or two-tailed. What do we do here? One-tailed or two-tailed test? One-tailed. Then another comma. And then you're going to indicate effect size. If you do Cohen's D, you can just write lowercase d and the number. I think ours was 1.24. Is that right? If it was R squared, we tend to write that as a percentage, so 32%. 0.32, I wouldn't nuke you for it, but it should technically be a percentage. So now, when you go look at the results section of a paper and you see something that looks like this, now you know what all the parts mean. T means that's the test we did. The number in parentheses means that was the degrees of freedom needed to look up the critical value. That gives you a sense about how big the samples were. The next number is the observed value. The next number tells you whether or not it was statistically significant. Then what kind of test it was, because a one-tailed test is easier to get a significant result than a two-tailed test because the window is bigger. And then effect size. We need to, in our, when we summarize it in a few sentences, mm -hmm. do we need to include anything in there about the size? No. Yeah. All I care about is the groups, what was compared about them, whether or not it was significant, and the direction of the effect. That alone. Now, if you want to say, I mean, when you say it's significant, that's pretty good. You could, you know, um, you could, if you wanted to throw that in there, that would be fine, but you wouldn't be docked points if you don't. Because that's that people don't even report effect size. So what they care about is whether it was significant or not. Right, does anybody have any questions about any of those steps? Yes? 
When we're doing another test and you want us to show your work, if we've already found a value, can we just plug it straight in further along in the problem? Or do you need us if it's... Uh, if you found a value in a previous step, yep, then you can just use the value from the previous okay. step. Yeah. In fact, on the test, and I think Javier will confirm this, I literally will give you, just like the worksheet, like I'll go, tell me this number, tell me this number, tell me this number, tell me this number, and I'll say, tell me sum of squares pooled, and I'll just write, S, S, subscript P equals, and then I expect you to write the number in the blank. So if you don't know what sum of squares, what S, S, subscript P stands for, then you're going to be in trouble. So one thing I want you to think about, for the test, I do not give you your formulas or those little charts of what's a small, medium, and large effect. So you want to be paying attention as we go through these problems, what formulas do I need? And those formulas need to be on your note card. That's why you guys get two sides of a note card to write on, because you get to choose which formulas you need. Okay. And you get to write them out the way that it makes sense to you. And if you want to put on your note card the step-by-step -step procedure for doing each one of these tests and the formula that you use at each stage, go for it. I don't care how you do it. But you've got your whole note card. And please remember, last time I had a bunch of people who had 3 by 5 cards. For the exam, you get a 4 by 6 note card. And as we do more and more complex stuff, believe me, you're going to want all 4 by 6 wonderful inches of that thing. Right? You're going to want all the inches you can get of note card to put stuff on. So. Uh, start thinking now, start making a list of the formulas that we use, and as we go through the next problem, I want you to think about what, what formulas we're using, how they're different, and if you think you're likely to get similar formulas confused, think about how to demarcate them on your note card so that it's very clear. This is for independent groups t-test, this is for related groups t-test, so you don't get them mixed up. Because the formulas for some things do change a little bit, and you don't want to get them confused. Okay, any other questions about independent groups t-test? Okay, yes? I'm a little confused about knowing which formulas we're going to use. Okay, well, so think about this. start off with, you can be pretty confident that you're going to need all these formulas, right? Here's formulas for independent samples. Here's formulas for related samples. And this handout is available online if you don't have it. As you see, I've marked those. And I've also told you over here <coughs> what those different symbols mean. Now, you also know, for example, that you had to know what the symbol N meant, right? You have to know that means sample size. You have to know that DF means degrees of freedom, and that to get that, that's N minus 1. You have to know things like um, how to calculate sum of squares, how to get sample variance, and those are things that are actually from earlier on. If you don't remember how to do sum of squares, that formula is up here. If you don't remember how to do sample variance, that formula is right here. So you want to take a look at the problem. We take a look at the, at the problem that I asked you to do. I give you a list of all the things that you need to be able to figure out, right? Degrees of freedom means sum of squares and sample variance for each sample. So you want to make sure you know the formulas to get those or how to figure it out. Like N, there's not really a formula to get it. Right? You just have to count the number of scores. Okay? Then you want to know degrees of freedom pooled and sum of squares pooled and pooled sample variance. So if you go down this list and look at all of the symbols, and you know how to get every one of those things, you should be good. Does that help? So the instruction, you know, the, the problem will actually give you instructions and clues about which formulas you need to have. And so what I would recommend is put together a list of the formulas you think you need. And then go to one of the practice problems and try to do it with only the formulas you picked. And if you realize you don't have enough information, then you're going to need to add something else to your card. Does that make sense?
So the problem set for independent and related groups t-tests is due a week from today. So we should get through related groups t-tests in a little bit. So you then should be able to make a list of the formulas you need for the two kinds of t-tests. And then you should see, go, go to the problem set and see if you can do the things on the problem set with just the formulas you picked. And if you can't, if you're missing information, then just add that to your list. Does that work? All right. Now, next, we're going to talk about related groups t-test. And we're going to do this and try to make this a little bit easier. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to imagine that the researcher we talked about last time decided to do the same experiment. You do not have this as a handout. This is available online, but I didn't get it printed out for you. Okay, so that's why you don't have this handout. But it's okay, because you actually know most of this stuff already. But this is available online. The copier was being fussy today, and I couldn't get copies made before class. So, uh, but look, this is exactly the same study. It just now, it's being done within subjects, okay? Meaning, one group of kids, and now those kids are reading two different books. Okay? Each child is reading a book that has a character with his or her name and a different book where none of the characters have the child's name. Okay? So each kid is reading two books now. And we've got six kids now, George, Harry, Ivana, Justin, Kelly, and Lauren. And they're reading two books. They're reading a modified story and an ordinary story. Now, just to keep things simple, if you look at the numbers here, you'll see these numbers are exactly the same ones as the previous problem. No difference in the numbers. Now, what we're going to do when we do a related groups t-test is instead of focusing on the raw data from the two conditions, we calculate a difference score for each subject. So if we compare the experimental condition with the control condition, what's the difference? And that's what you see here. Let me move this up now. That's what you see here. We've just calculated. So George read the modified story for four minutes and the ordinary story for two minutes. His difference score is two. Does that make sense? The difference of two minutes. And the fact that it's positive tells you that the modified story was read for a longer period of time. Harry read the modified story for 16 minutes, the ordinary story for five minutes, and his difference score was 11. So he really liked having his name in the story. Harry's all about Harry. Ivana, 11 and seven, the difference is four. Justin, nine and nine, Justin doesn't care. Kelly, eight and six, with a difference of two. Lauren, 14 and 7 with a difference of 7. Okay, so that's where those different scores are coming from. Is everybody clear where those are coming from? Okay. Now, at this point, we literally can just ignore these scores now. We don't care about them anymore. Related groups t-test is done on the different scores. Okay, so we don't care about that raw data anymore. All we care about is the difference for each subject. So I'm going to ignore these scores from this point forward. I don't care anything about that. I'm going to go ahead now and calculate the same kinds of things that we did for the independent samples for this new sample of different scores. So I'm going to calculate a mean. because I had you calculate a mean, right, for the individual samples. So I'm now going to calculate a mean for my different scores. And we note that the mean of the difference, well, we can talk about the Sample size of the difference, in this case it's six. How do I know that? Because one, two, three, four, five, six, six scores in that sample. What do you think the degrees of freedom of the different scores is? Five. Yeah, there you go. It's just this minus one. Mean of the difference. I just take these scores and calculate the mean. And I end up with 4.33. Did 
Then, just like you guys did for calculating sum of squares before, I calculate deviations, and then I square the deviations, and I come up with this number here, 81.34. And that's the sum of squares for the different scores. Okay, and that's using the definitional formula. I use definitional formulas. I like them much better than computational formulas. So this is all the kind of stuff that you should be able to calculate with 3510 knowledge. Means, degrees of freedom, sum of squares. Yeah. X minus X of D. Okay, x minus which one? M sub D. Okay, x, this is the deviation score, so this is the different scores. This is the different scores minus the mean of the different scores. So if you were calcu calculating deviations, notice this is almost zero, right? Because the rounding error is point, it's point oh 0.02. Then we square those. We get the square of some deviations. That gives us the sum of squares. Mm -hmm. And so this is the sum of squares for the difference, 81.34. So this is all only on the difference scores. That's all it's about. But the point oh 0.02 isn't the variance? This right here is if we added, this is the sum. If we had no rounding error, this would be zero. The sum of deviations should be zero. But because we round to two decimal places, there's sometimes a little bit of rounding error here. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we can't take an average of that. It's not very meaningful because the average of zero doesn't tell us anything. So instead, we square the numbers and then we divide by the number of scores and that gives us the sum of squares. Does that answer your question? So is everybody okay with where the mean of the different scores came from and the sum of squares for the different scores? Okay, so given that information, can you tell me, is the null hypothesis going to be much different? Before, our null hypothesis was, there will be no difference in how long children who read a story with their name in it read compared to children who read a story that doesn't have their name in it. <coughs> Pretty close, except we want to make it clear that we're talking about the same group of kids. So how can we do that? Kind of maybe mush the words around a little bit. Say something like, there will be no difference in how long children read, whether they read a story with their name in it or a story without their name in it. Something like that. Doesn't matter how you say it, as long as it's clear what groups you're comparing, what you're comparing about the groups, that you're predicting no significant difference, and that you're comparing one group of subjects to themselves. As long as you do that, your null <coughs> hypothesis will be golden. The alternative hypothesis before was children who read a story with their name in it will read for a significantly longer period of time than children who read a story without their name in it. How could we modify that to make it within subjects? Go for it. The worst thing that could happen is you would be wrong. And then I will give you the feedback, and then you will be right. Otherwise, we just sit here in silence, and that's really frustrating. So, so okay. children who read, there is a difference between uh, children who read a, a book with their name in it versus a book without their name in it? Okay, so, yep, we're getting much closer. Right. The idea is to make it clear there's only one group okay, so, of children, right? Yeah, so. Right? So, uh, children will read 
a book with their name in it for a significantly longer period of time than they'll read one without their name in it, or something like that. You're really close. Right, no, you're, you're on, actually on the right track. You just said, you have to think about the wording so that if somebody who didn't know what we were talking about read it, they would be clear that you were comparing one group of kids reading two books. Does that work? Yeah, you're, on the, you're actually on the right track. Anybody want to try another version? I was thinking like when children read a book with their name in it, and when they read a book without their name in it, they will read the one with their name in it for longer. Okay, that works too. It's wordy. It's wordy, but it gets the point across. And I don't, I'm not as worried about wordiness as you're including all the points. You can do it with, you know, multiple sentences if you want to. A researcher wants to compare one group of children reading two books, one with their name in it and one without their name in it. He predicts that when they read the book with their name in it, they'll read for a significantly longer period of time. I can live with that too. Whatever makes sense to you. Okay? Whatever makes sense to you. As long as you're including all the points, I'm good. So is are we gonna do a one tail test or two tail test? So the Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So the no would be just like when children read a blah blah blah, mm -hmm. they will there would be no difference between this and the book. Yeah. You got it. So a researcher wants to compare children reading a book with their name in it and children reading a book without, or the same kids reading a book without their name in it. Uh, the null hypothesis predicts there will be no difference in how long they read the two books. Yep, totally fine. Okay. So is the fact that we're doing within subjects t-test going to change the, the one-tailed test, two-tailed test thing? Mm -hmm. Can I be two it's hard to find a difference between an increased difference, right? How do we decide whether a test is one-tailed or two-tailed? It shows direction. It shows direction, <coughs> right? The direction of the prediction. What's our prediction? What's the researcher expecting? That there will be a difference. That there's going to be a difference. And not just that there's going to be a difference, but there's going to be a particular kind of difference, right? That when the kids read the story with their name in it, they're going to read for a significantly longer period of time than when they read the story that doesn't have their name in it. That's a directional prediction. And as a result, we're still doing a one-tailed test. So one-tailed, two-tailed has nothing to do with between or within subjects. It makes no difference whatsoever. Whether it's a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test has everything to do with the alternate hypothesis. If that alternate hypothesis is directional, you're doing a one-tailed test. If that alternate hypothesis is not directional, it's just a general one saying there will be some difference, then it's a two-tailed test. It doesn't make any difference whether you're talking about a between subjects design or a within subjects design. So in this case, the fact that we're doing a one-tailed test does not change from the previous one. Because we're still testing effectively this, the same hypothesis, which is that modified stories are more interesting to kids than ordinary stories. All right, given an alpha level of 0.05, what t-score will define the boundary of the critical region for our hypothesis test? Now here, we're gonna get into something a little bit different. Last time, what value did we use to look up? Our critical value. Last time we used alpha 0.05, Proportion in one tail, and what degrees of freedom did we use? We did independent groups. Ten, Ten right? It was degrees of freedom pooled. Because we had to use degrees of freedom because we had two samples. And we pooled them together. Degrees of freedom one plus degrees of freedom two. Well, we don't have that anymore. Remember? All we care all we care about right now are these different scores. Okay? That's all we care about. Are these different scores. We know that the end of our different scores is six. So the degrees of freedom we're going to use to look up the critical value now, five. So here's something that does change between independent samples and related samples. And that is the degrees of freedom that you use to look up the critical value. The degrees of freedom for the independent samples t-test has to take into consideration both groups of subjects. In the related samples t-test, You've only got one group of subjects. And they generate one set of different scores. And we use the degrees of freedom for that set of different scores. And so that's just going to be, it's almost like we have just one sample. Right? One group of kids. 
So now we're going to use degrees of freedom 5. We're going to come over here to our proportion in one tail. And we get what critical value? How would I round that? 2.02. .02. And I'm going to say positive 2.02 .02 because my alternate hypothesis predicts that the modified score is going to be higher than the ordinary score. I'm expecting a positive value. Yeah. I know you said that we'll have to know the um, formulas on our own, but we will we'll get that. I will give you the critical value tables. You bet. I would never expect you to memorize critical value tables. Okay. Nobody does that ever. Okay. Ever. That would be like some kind of sick and demented. And I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will give you, for the test, I will give you, for example, for this upcoming test, you will need the t-distribution and the f-max statistic, and I will give you both of those. All right. Okay. So we figured out what our critical t-critical value is. What do we need to look up that value? We need to know the degrees of freedom of the difference, the alpha, and whether it's one tail or two tail. Now, it says calculate the following for the difference data. Well, we've already done the first one, because we had to do degrees of freedom of the difference in order to look up our critical value. So we've already done that one. Check. It's five. It's the sample size of the difference, minus one. Done. Now we have to figure out the sample variance for the difference, the estimated standard error of the difference, and then we'll calculate the observed. Okay. Sample variance, estimated standard error, and then T observed. I'm going to hide screen now so that I can lift this up and we can write on the board. I need about five times more screen space than I have. Okay. First thing, we have to calculate sample variance of the difference. Now before, when we did this for pooled samples, it was sum of squares pooled over degrees of freedom pooled, right? That was how we got the pooled sample variance. And not surprisingly, I told you, sample variance is always sum of squares something over degrees of freedom something. Sum of squares something over degrees of freedom something. Well, given the calculations we've already done, what sum of squares something do you think we're going to use? The difference. And what degrees of freedom something do you think we're going to use? I'm like on the price is right. <laughs> degrees of freedom of the difference. Okay. It's like not tricky at all if you use the subscripts. It's like, oh, I get it. It's a secret. As long as you pay attention to those letters, you're like, 